Today's show is sponsored by the Dog Cancer Survival Guide, the best-selling book that helps you help your dog with cancer. Join the companion private support group at dogcancersupport.com and get the email newsletter at dogcancernews.com. I recommend that they familiarize themselves with the breed and the best place to go is to that breed's parent club website. So the Golden Retriever Club of America has a fabulous website that has information about the history, information about breeders, information about health concerns. And within that, uh, there are breeders that do the recommended health checks as recommended by that breed's parent club. And AKC designates those breeders, honors them by giving them the recognition to call breeders of merit. Welcome to Dog Cancer Answers, where we help you help your dog with cancer. Here's your host, James Jacobson. Hello, friend. One thing that all dog lovers have in common is that they do not want their beloved dogs to get cancer. Not ever. And if you're listening to me now, you have probably already been through that heartbreak at least once. And you hope that maybe there is a way that you can avoid it in the next dog that you get. Well, today's guest is Dr. Jerry Klein, a longtime veterinarian and a dog lover who also serves as the chief veterinary officer of the American Kennel Club. While none of us has a crystal ball, Dr. Klein is here to tell us how to choose a breeder who is making every effort to produce the healthiest puppies possible and to avoid genetic health conditions that could cause problems down the road. Choosing wisely, no matter what breed or mix you're interested in, can help to minimize the risk that your new pup will fall victim to a genetic health problem. Dr. Klein, thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you for having me. So you have been a veterinarian for a few years and you've been at the AKC for seven. Do you wanna share how long you've been a practicing veterinarian? Uh, I graduated from vet school in 1979 and moved to Chicago shortly afterwards and started practicing emergency medicine, which I thought was going to be a one-year stint and became about a 35-year stint. And what brought you to the American Kennel Club? When I was a kid, I came from a non-doggy family and I basically coerced them into getting me a dog. And I would try to do all things dog we about things in the library was and uh i went to a dog show i found that and i realized that i was infatuated with that and i learned to show my own dog and then i lined myself with people that bred them and and handled them and that got me helped me to get a position as a veterinarian and then eventually i became a judge so the fact that i had kind of wore all hats uh, i owned purebred dogs. I showed my dogs. I bred certain litters after a period of time of being involved for a while, didn't jump into it. I judged. And then I'm also a veterinarian. They felt that I was a, a good fit to be a liaison, so to speak, between the general public, my fellow professionals, uh, veterinarians and vet techs, and the purebred dog fanciers. Now, the AKC has a deep, long history. When did the AKC start? I think it's like 138 years old. Yeah. And it started out primarily as a registry body. Mm-hmm. So the role of having an AKC vet, are there more than one or are you it? I'm it. And amazingly, I'm the first and I suspect I won't be the last, but I'm very honored to be the first and to hold this position because it's a great form of outreach. I mean, I, I felt when I was doing emergency medicine, I really kind of helped lives with every shift. But uh, this position is different because it's far reaching. It goes to not just a local thing, but national, even international readership and appeal. And it's uh, interesting and challenging as well. Why did the AKC open this up? What does a veterinarian at the American Kennel Club do? Basically a spokesperson for all things uh, health related and questions that may arise, whether it's things happening in the moment, like for example, when the canine influenza uh, appeared in this country, I happen to be practicing in Chicago, which is ground zero, but uh, having implement kind of regulations and uh, recommendations for show giving clubs, you know, and uh, just, it's very similar to, when you think about it, what COVID happened uh, in human medicine as well. It had to the information to get out to the public to try to prevent the spread of a certain disease. So this is just one aspect of it, but also for information or misinformation about health and management and trying to get awareness for the best ownership and handling of dogs. Now, obviously, our listeners are very interested in in dogs with cancer. 
And a lot of them are concerned that their dog may have cancer as a result of, you know, of genetics. What are some of the things that you and the AKC position wise take as it relates to cancer? Well, I think something that has to be important to be noted about the American Kennel Club is that it's a club of clubs. It's uh, comprised of many clubs, all breed clubs, uh, let's say the Sacramento Kennel Club, but also, and very importantly, parent breed club. And when we talk about a parent breed club, we're talking about that breed's national breed club. So if I'm talking about Siberian Huskies, the Siberian Husky Club of America, they're the ones that write the standard for that breed, not the American Kennel Club. But I, I think what's important is that and many people sometimes feel that the American Kennel Club are the ones that write the breed standards and do the actual uh, health test recommendations. In fact, they do not. That is all done by the individual breed parent clubs that are regulated under the umbrella of the American Kennel Club. Got it. Okay. So now that we kind of understand the politics of it, as it relates to cancer, what are your thoughts in terms of genetics and breed standards and all that in terms of the proclivity of some breeds, you know, to have more cancer than others, say golden retrievers or boxers. Of course. And I think a couple of things goes into that uh, when people decide to get a dog. One thing that I discourage is impulse buying or impulse adopting, which unfortunately in the last year we saw a great deal of because people had a knee-jerk reaction to get a dog or cat because they need a, a loneliness or companionship. And they sometimes get a dog and this year, we found many dogs and cats either that either people didn't know what they were getting or was a bit of a concern because they may want to relinquish them, which we'd never want. We want an AKC, something called a good match, which is when people do their research and understand what the breed entails, what it was bred to do. So it acts in a certain way. It's not a surprise. So the chance for a lifelong relationship is improved rather than concerns and either return to the breeder or worse, relinquish to a shelter. So being informed about a breed means and knowing things about its breed health. And when someone asks me, I want to get, let's say, a golden retriever, I recommend that they familiarize themselves with the breed. And the best place to go is to that breed's parent club website. So the Golden Retriever Club of America mm -hmm. has a fabulous website that has information about the history, information about breeders, information about health concerns. And within that, there are breeders that do the recommended health checks as recommended by that breed's parent club. And AKC designates those breeders, honors them by giving them the recognition of called breeders of merit. And these are breeders that have been involved in particular breed for a certain period of time. In other words, they're not a fly-by-night breeder, not having a litter this year and getting out of the breed the next year. Sometimes they've been in for generations. And then they are aware of the breed health issues. They recommend the required health tests, and they publish it, the results, if possible, in an open transparency area called the OFA, the Orthopedic Foundation of America, which is transparent information center where you can look up dogs, look up by the breed, and that OFA also lists breed concern by breed as well. So I would urge people to, A, look at the Parent Club website and also go to the OFA and look up an individual breed and its health concerns and whatever's available for health testing. Is there only one officially sanctioned website or club for each breed? Like you would say, you know, so you go to the Golden Retrievers Club, club of America. America. Yeah. So there's just that one resource if you're interested in a golden. Well, Golden Retrievers have many, many local breed clubs. Sure. But the, the parent club is the sure. one that organized all of them. They are the ones that form the breed standard. They are the ones who do the regulation of that breed. And the members of that breed are the ones that may recognize any health issues that are occurring, often with work with your veterinarian. They talk amongst each other. And if they find that there's a health concern, they oftentimes fund research through the Canine Health Foundation, for example, to try to either figure out if there's a genetic basis for it or forms of treatment. Canine Health Foundation is an affiliate of the American Kennel Club, and it's the largest not-for-profit organization strictly dedicated to canine health and research. So much has been done over like $60 million towards canine health and research. So it's been a great asset for to know about what we know about canine health, and not just for purebred dogs, but for all dogs, because they do studies like in epilepsy, cardiac disease, cancers. So it doesn't affect just a golden retriever, but it'll affect dogs that are getting that kind of disease. Let's tease out that OFA. That is a single repository that all of these, the Golden Retriever Club of America and, the, and its corollary for the different breeds, 
connect with to contain medical information? It is. It's a transparent database. And not every single breed has it, but I think over like 130 breeds do have the ability to form in conjunction with Canine Health Foundation, something called having a chick number, a Canine Health Information Center number. These are dogs that have passed all the recommended health checks as recommended by that breed's parent club. So as an owner, prospective owner, and I'm going to a breeder, hopefully a responsible breeder of merit, I would ask uh, the breeder, do you have documentation that your dog, the sire or the dam, has been checked for these various issues? What are the problems in the breed? And what you're looking for is transparency from the breeder. Okay. And then when you say it is down to the dog level, so literally like you can basically look up an animal that way? My dog, for example, by name is listed with his birth date, his sex, his sire, his dam, their health results. Their, that dog's sire and dam, you can go back generations and a way of ascertaining. For example, it started out as a hip regulation against hip dysplasia. Which is the orthopedic, the O part of the, because I was like, why is this about orthopedic? That's where the O started. Yeah. It started with hips, it moved to elbows, and does things like progressive retinal atrophy, cardiomyopathy. So whatever tests can be done as recommended by that breed that can be tested, that's a listing of dogs that have passed those health checks or have not. So your dog is listed. Is that because you are a veterinarian or can anyone list their dog? Oh, no. Anyone can and should if they're going to be breeding dogs. Okay. And so by having this data on the mother and the father, it will help a person make a a better informed decision about the genetics and the proclivity for issues. Yes. But I think what it really does, if I was a novice person or was guiding someone to get a dog, it tells me that the person I'm getting it from has done their due diligence to be committed to that breed, mm. to have a certain responsibility, because there's no guarantees in life. Right. And anyone that says that, that's a red flag. Mm. But what it's telling me is the person that I'm going to is someone that cares and understands that things can happen, but I'm doing the best job I can to minimize the possibilities of problems for you, for me, and for anyone else that gets one of my dogs. That is really good to know. You know, let's take a short break right here. But when we return, let's talk about red flags to look for when choosing a puppy or a breeder. We'll be right back. Do you have a dog with cancer? Need a little support? Well, please join us and find a few thousand new friends in our private Facebook group called Dog Cancer Support. Our group is the least judgmental, most helpful and supportive group on the platform, and it is rigorously monitored for kindness. You won't be asked for money or sold anything or ganged up on if someone disagrees with your choices. You will be listened to, empathized with, and given gentle support and solid advice. We average 75% participation for a reason. It's the only place on Facebook that feels like a truly loving group of people. And if you're not a member yet, join today by typing dog cancer support into the search box in Facebook or by going directly to dogcancersupport.com. We'll see you there. And we are back with Dr. Klein. Well, let's talk a little bit about those guarantees and those red flags. What are some things that a person who's interested in getting a purebred should look out for in terms of really being able to suss out if this is a reputable breeder and more directly, if this puppy is the right one. Well, after you've done your homework to decide that this is the breed for you and have decided that maybe that is a person that you might want to inquire about, depending on the popularity of the breed, first stuff I would see is, What kind of questions is the breeder asking me? Mm. Because am I going to be a qualified owner? When I get inquiries for one of my puppies, I stay up late at night thinking about losing sleep. Am I going to sell one of my puppies to this person? And if I don't feel, I may ask, where do you live? Do you have a fenced in yard? What kind of time do you have? So the, the kind of questions that person is asking the prospective owner tells me an awful lot about the breeder. So if they basically are trying to disqualify you as good enough to have one of their puppies, they may actually be a a better breeder. In a way, it's it's part of my family, of course. And someone that, you know, oftentimes someone says, I want a uh, silver poodle, you know, for my son's birthday next week. 
And guess what? They may not have one because it shouldn't be just merchandise. I'm not saying it's not going to be available, but someone that doesn't have a dog at that very moment is not a bad thing. Oftentimes, it's a very good thing. And oftentimes, the responsible breeder, if they don't have it, will either put you on the list for a litter they have coming up and you have to be able to wait, or they'll refer you to another responsible breeder. But part of the, the responsibility lies on the prospective purchaser mm-hmm. because they oftentimes in this society want something tomorrow in a color or maybe yesterday. And I hate to wait 24 hours. And so some of the problem has to be put on both hands. It's not just the breeder. In fact, oftentimes, it's this, the, uh, the demand and the, the need to feel like it should be dealt with as merchandise, which it certainly should not. Getting a puppy is not as simple as going online and ordering something on Amazon. In some ways, it's become like that. The question you're asked is, how do I tell a responsible breeder? Mm-hmm. That's what I would tell someone. What are some other red flags or things that would make you go, huh, this may not be the right breeder? Depending on your, your ability to go to the breeder, you should at least ask, Can I go and see the litter? Can I go see the dam? Now, whether you can physically or not is up to you. Some people fly. I've had people fly from Seattle to come to see me to get a dog. But the answer should always be, of course, you can't just drop in, but with an appointment, you can stop by. The answer should be, of course, you can within the limits of my schedule. Mm -hmm. But if you are not allowed or they're not, you're not available to see the dam or the litter of puppies, for me, that would be. A red flag. That is really good advice because firsthand I've done that and I've flown places not that far from one island to another multiple times to make sure that it was the right situation. So when you go and look at the breeder, are there things that are giant red flags or not? Like, is someone who's doing this out of their home in their backyard, does that make them a backyard puppy mill? Well, I've taken great offense is being called a backyard breeder because Mm -hmm. I have a beautiful backyard that my husband (laughs) tends to beautifully. And I have a litter every perhaps four or five years. And so if someone calls me a backyard breeder, I am take great pride in it. I, I'm not denigrated, but I take offense if someone thinks it's an f- offensive term. Right. I'm a responsible hobby breeder, mm. and my backyard is lovely. I invite you to it if you're ever in Chicago. Okay, I will do it, but not in the middle of the winter. I, I think the quality of the yard or the location and the, the animal husbandry, they don't have to have cushions, but the animals should be kept in good condition, clean. There should be good records. There should be great openness and transparency and, and information. A good breeder wants a client to have a dog, a perfect one for life. They're willing to answer questions after that sale is done. They're willing to have either as a contract, if something doesn't go right, they want to know about it. They're willing to have first right of refusal and, and to be able to get the dog back. I don't want my dog, if I sell it to you and you decide after like six months, you don't like that dog to go and sell it to someone else. I want you to tell me about it and I'll see if I can find a home for that dog or give it back to me. That's how I deal with it. Because you feel that you have a fiduciary and a yeah. responsibility to take care of it this is. puppy and to make sure this it hobby is. is an extension of my life. Mm. I got into breeding African hounds. It's determined where I live, the kind of car I drive, every aspect of my life. So when I am breeding a litter of puppy, and I put as much time and effort to the entire litter, I have no idea if there could be one puppy born or seven. I may only keep one in that litter, but the six other ones have to go to wonderful homes. And I the same kind of care and commitment and money goes into the breeding and formulation of that of that litter. And I want every single one of them. For me, my favorite time is a year later at, during Christmas time that I get a Christmas card from a family with the dog and the kids and everything else. They can't always be perfect, but that's what you strive for. And it can be an investment, the searching process. Say you decide on, you want an Afghan or a Golden Retriever or a Maltese, and you're looking for the right breeder. My thinking is that patience is the most important thing and that you're not going to find it perfect the first time and that you should invest the time and the money associated with with waiting well i think the waiting is something that in our society today is an unfortunate thing that we don't have a lot of we're impatient and i mentioned before impulse and impulse buying we tend to think of everything needing it now instant gratification now it may be the first person you inquire may happen to have that dog that you're looking for i'm not trying to deny that that could happen but if you have the luxury of not but try to do due diligence and try to put some effort and realize that it might not be an instant kind of a thing 
So we are really obviously talking exclusively on this episode about purebreds, but the entire world has become a lot easier to find whatever kind of dog you want, whether you are adopting a dog from a shelter or trying to find the perfect next show dog or pet or pet pet. yeah absolutely i mean my dogs are pure pet grade but they're but they're amazing as are mine they can be both yeah there's this whole new cosmology of websites designed to help you find and shop and they tend to put a lot of awfully cute pictures of puppies on there and I understand that sometimes what they're putting up is not exactly what is available. Well, I can't speak for that because that's not my world necessarily. Mm -hmm. I've had to take care of some of those dogs that have been acquired. And some dogs are just wonderful. And some dogs, unfortunately, may have issues, whether it's temperament and or health. But what it is, is depending where these dogs were obtained, or adopted, you don't have as much of a chance of predictability that you may have when you get a purebred dog from a responsible breeder. Well, let's go through some of the questions that you should be asking a breeder before actually making the commitment and purchasing a puppy from them. Well, as I mentioned, OFA, let's say the most basics, especially a a medium to large breed, they start out as a hip registry. And one of the requisites for getting your dog passed for, let's say, hip dysplasia is having your dog x-rayed and being free of hip dysplasia. And the requisite, the dog has to be at least two years of age. And the reason for that is because some dogs can become dysplastic over a period of time. So they feel that by two years of age, any signs of hip laxity would show up in a radiograph by about two years of age. Uh, certainly things can worsen, but the biggest concern, the reason hip dysplasia reared its ugly head, is because there were dysplastic and semi-crippled dogs at a year, year and a half of age. And we knew this because of the military did their first kind of testing. So I'm always a little concerned when people breed dogs that are less than two years of age, not just because they can't register and do their hips, but I find as a veterinarian, things start to show up in the first year or two of their life. Uh, not, Not everything. Let's say epilepsy. A dog may seizure at any point in their life, idiopathic epilepsy, up to even six years of age, but is more likely to see it up to the first two years of age. Now, as a responsible breeder, if I keep a dog and has a seizure, I'm not going to incorporate that into my breeding program. Now, there's no genetic test to really screen out for idiopathic epilepsy. You're going on the goodness and the goodwill of the breeder. But I know people, let's say for a say with a standard poodle, they had a beautiful dog and it had a seizure at a year and a half of age. And they eventually neutered it and put it in a wonderful pet home. It's a beautiful dog and they were going to use it at stud. And of course, they opted not to. So breeding a dog too young, not having adequate health checks as recommended by their breed parent club, not being able to have access to see the litter or the dam if I request, those are all red flags. Now, you mentioned OFA. Are there other websites or other organizations that track this? I know there's Embark. And um, Embark is a genetic testing of certain kind of things. It's not a guarantee. It's just a predisposition that a breed may have certain kind of problems. But as an open database of uh, tests that have been done and the results, that's the major one that incorporates everything else. PenVet does hips, but uh, OFA does things besides hips. And it works in conjunction with Canine Health Foundation. Okay. And so the Canine Health Foundation is, again, sort of an arm of the American Kennel Club? It's an affiliate, uh, correct. And you said that they provide funding for universities to do research for various ailments for dogs. Conditions, ailments, but they also do research against tick-borne disease and other things that may be of concern to the health of dogs. We're going to take a break right here, but when we come back, I want to talk specifically about breeds and cancer. We are talking with Dr. Klein from the American Kennel Club. We'll be right back. I want to let you know about an important newsletter. It's called Dog Cancer News. Now, with a name like that, it is not for everyone. But if your dog has cancer, you will want to subscribe. That's because every issue features articles that will be helpful, such as low-carb dog cancer diet recipes, new clinical trials, financial resources to help pay for cancer care, information on supplements, and lots of other helpful info that your veterinarian may not know or have the time to share with you. Also, when you subscribe to Dog Cancer News, you will get a weekly update on the topics covered on this podcast, along with links and resources. So how much does Dog Cancer News cost? 
Well, today you can subscribe for free. It's our gift. For a limited time, you can get a full year subscription for free. No strings attached. Just go to this website to sign up for the newsletter now, dogcancernews.com. It takes less than 10 seconds to subscribe and it is totally free. Do it now at dogcancernews.com. And we are back. So if a prospective owner is researching dog breeds, where would they look to find accurate information about genetic health problems in a particular breed? Uh, To understand the breed, you'd have to go to the Breeds Parent Club website to understand what the current concerns of that breed's members are of their own chosen breed. So if you're looking at, I don't know, Golden retrievers, because goldens tend to have a really high level of cancer. Or boxers, are there particular questions that you'd want to be looking at to make sure that while I've already committed, I want a golden retriever, I understand the risks, but it is less likely that this dog is going to develop cancer? Well, there are some breeds where their parent club recommends a cardiac testing at let's say a year of age or some breeds until two years of age or in some breeds every year or for eye for cataracts with an ophthalmologist so depending on the breed depending on the condition and depending on what can be tested uh those are the things that might be found within that breed i mean i know that the morris animal foundation has been working on this really big study on golden retrievers right and specifically cancer Is there any way that you, as someone who wants a golden retriever, can have access to that to kind of connect that and, again, reduce the odds of getting a golden who develops cancer? Well, one of the problems with goldens and cancer was that a prolific sire of 25, 30 years ago became uh, used enough that it kind of wed spread through the gene pool. So it became difficult. But say this again. This is news I've never heard. Well, I think the reason something becomes in a breed is because a certain dog may be used at stud or used as a brood bitch and problems can happen. And let's face it, that can happen. And I think hemangiosarcoma is probably due to a dog or a certain line of dogs that had this condition. Just like hip dysplasia that happens in certain lines, certain breeds of dogs. So it literally can be traced to this one? I don't know if it's that one dog, but that dog was a winner that ended up having it. I think it's been some uh, suspects that that dog help the condition become fairly widespread within the breed. Right now, it's so diverse that you can't just pinpoint it. I'd be like trying to do that with people with a certain condition. So what you're trying to do, the kind of questions that I would ask is, how old is the mother and the father? Are the grandparents still alive? What do they die of? Mm. I mean, there's nothing wrong with asking those questions. And I think that that's, it would be very important for me to want it if I want a golden retriever. I would ask, you know, anyone trying to get an African hound from me, I expect them to ask intelligent questions about how, where are my dogs? How long do they live? I can tell you exactly. About my line of dogs live to be 12 to 14 years of age. They always have. Uh, and I expect that. They don't ever live past that time. They're African hounds. They were raised from generations in Afghanistan. There was no veterinarians in Afghanistan. So the survival of the fittest. They live a long life. When they get old, they get sick and they die. And to be truthful, that's ex- they don't have things like Cushing's or epilepsy. So every breed has certain conditions. But what I find interesting is the more ancient breeds have less of uh, health issues than the ones who were developed in the last 150 years. Why do you suppose that is? A richer genetic pool? Well, because of those breeds were survival of the fittest. Uh-huh. Again, in Afghanistan, Egypt, Saudi Arabia, and uh, in the Congo, there were not veterinarians taking care of these dogs. <laughs> so they lived, and uh, the most fit are the ones that live to tell. A shout out to my Maltese again. <laughs> Old breed, right? What precautions should a breeder be taking to protect their puppy's health? Well, always the best nutrition possible that's age appropriate and best for that type of breed. Sanitary conditions, parasite prevention, whether it's intestinal parasites, uh, worms, or coccidial or protozoal parasites, making sure the parents are on proper management. So health nutrition, and then also socialization at the proper time. So they're not like locked away. They have enough human interaction at the proper time. So these dogs are well socialized. And that's the advantage of getting a dog from a responsible breed versus a dog they're getting from a shelter who may be absolutely great health and a great dog and wonderfully socialized. You just don't know. 
low. And again, there's no guarantees, but you're just trying to minimize that risk. So when we're proponents of a purebred dog, it's for their predictability factor. And if you're going to get a purebred dog, you try to get one from a responsible breeder. Because unfortunately, in this day and age, we can't label everyone and under that same kind of term, I think. Well, let's talk a little bit about that in, in this day and age of COVID. Obviously, when the pandemic struck, a lot of people started staying home and they wanted to add a dog to the family. As they added those dogs, you know, we hear stories about shelters basically being emptied. Was there a greater demand on purebred breeders? There may have been, but purebred breeders, the good ones, didn't start breeding left and right because they had their own agenda. Now, other ones that thought as a marketplace, I think that they saw a need to be filled. And like any vacuum, uh, things started to happen. So I think that those breeders that were doing what they were doing before, they didn't amp up their breeding schedule just because of COVID. In fact, many people curtailed it, but other people chose to supply this need. And I think something interesting about the shelters being emptied initially, like in February and March, there was a concern that a lot of people had, from what I read, that they were going to contract COVID from their pets, dogs, or cats. And there was a concern because what's going on in other countries that people were going to relinquish their dogs and cats and were getting rid of them. And so the shelters were preparing for an onslaught of getting dogs and cats into shelters. So what they did is they got rid of as many as they could into foster homes to make way for the potentiality that people were going to start to relinquish their own dogs and cats. As it turned out, it didn't happen, thank God. People did not feel the need to get rid of their own dogs and cats because we did an incredible amount of good information that you cannot contract it from your dog and cat. So they weren't willing to get rid of them. But on the other hand, they decided to get dogs and cats. And that was great for the shelters because they were able to find homes for a lot of the, the, the dogs and cats all over. I recall that nano moment when people were saying it was going to, I think there was something, a dog in Hong Kong had eaten a tissue and maybe they thought maybe that was connected with the owner getting COVID or something like that. Yeah, but it, was, it was a scary time, a lot of questions, and we didn't have a lot of answers. And I think a lot of people, everyone, veterinarians, shelter workers, healthcare workers, didn't know where this was leading, and they're trying to do the best thing possible to prevent some kind of a panic response. So would that be a fair question to ask a breeder? Like, have you been selling more puppies now that, uh, that it's COVID time? I mean, you could ask a breeder. I'm not sure how much importance I would place on the answer, depending how they answer the question. Mm. I give everyone the benefit of the doubt until it's proven or said saying something that strikes me off. And let's face it, not everyone takes care of dogs the way I do, but it doesn't necessarily make it wrong. Right. But I always look at it with some form of open mind to make sure it's done properly. So if one were to try to be Columbo and try to really, you know, make sure that the questions are smart and uh, they are leading enough to get a breeder to reveal the true nature of their of their reading. What are some of the things that you would do or some of the more tough questions that you would ask? Well, I would ask how long they've been involved in the breed. What was their reason for getting into it? And they're going to ask, what's your reason for getting into it? Really, because it should be that kind of conversation. So you should hear them pushing, but not pushing back in a, in a confrontational way. It's but a conversation. It's a conversation. Mm -hmm. It's a conversation where you're both should be listening to each other, where the point is, it isn't for someone just to get rid of a dog, mm -hmm. but to make sure the person getting a dog is the right person for that dog. And then what about recommendations and talking to past clients? Every breeder may certainly do that. I know that there have been names that have been around in my breed, the Afghan Hound, where there have been people through the years that have obtained dogs and either not care for them properly or gotten rid of them. And those names get out, especially in this day and age. This is before social media. Now, I'm sure it's very possible to denigrate someone. So the thing is, it's not a smear or, or cancel culture, but I think that if someone is doing this for the wrong reason and someone gets the gist of this, uh, responsible breeders hang out together and they talk. You know, and so if something doesn't seem right or if someone had a bad experience, we all do this in the dog's or in the puppy's best interest. Our job is to make sure that everything goes smoothly. If we know someone's a bad apple, a potential someone who's going to buy a dog, I'll do whatever I can so that my dogs don't get in bad homes. But I want to make sure someone else's dog don't either. We talked about this earlier when you were saying, well, if someone guarantees their dog, that's sort of like something you really resist because there are no guarantees in life. but are there any guarantees? Do breeders ever have any sort of guarantees? Oftentimes in contracts, there may be something that's saying that 
if the dog has any genetic issues or with the have discovered by a veterinarian, what they'll do is there's no guarantee they won't get it, but they will offer to either pay the cost up to a certain number or a certain period of time or take the dog back. I don't think, know of any contract or any uh, responsible breed that says, I guarantee that this dog will be healthy because guess what? All animals and people can get sick and there are no guarantees in life. As an emergency veterinarian, unfortunately, I saw that way too often. If something just has, I should ask this question. What are your thoughts about pet insurance in general? I have it because uh, I don't work at the emergency clinic anymore. And, <laughs> it's not uh, it, free. <laughs> it's not free. And here's the thing. The options we have now for a gold care standard of health care is what we expect with ourselves. Mm-hmm. You know, when I started in, in veterinary medicine, MRIs and CT scans and ultrasounds were not the thing du jour, but now they're standard part of diagnosing. I mean, that's, that's part of a diagnostic protocol. And if you have a dog that has conditions, let's say, hemolytic anemia that requires lots of blood tests or transfusions, that's very costly. And let me tell you, as an emergency vet, the uh, most concerning conversations I have with clients was not telling that their dog or cat had a certain condition, but rather telling them how much something may cost, mm. either to do further test treatment or surgery. And there's nothing worse than someone having to make a decision because they can't afford it. Now, you can do a savings account if you have that kind of discipline to put money aside, but I don't know if everyone does. And like everything else in insurance, if nothing goes wrong, well, it's money that you could have used for something else. But if something does go wrong, you'll be glad that you have that and you don't have that anxiety. And the reason I say this, I just had to write an article about pet insurance. So I recommend it to people getting dogs because, you know, God willing, nothing will go wrong. But unfortunately, something may go wrong. Accidents or illnesses. We mentioned golden doodles earlier, and they're just one example of these designer breeds. What are some of the red flags that you know people should look out for and stay clear of when they look at these designer breeds? The problem with designer breeds, you can't lump them into any one thing because since they haven't been regulated, so to speak, I've seen labradoodles that are the size of a miniature poodle and some that are the size of a great Pyrenees. I've seen some with really great coat texture. I've seen some with horrible coat texture. I've seen some very easygoing dispositions and some not so easygoing dispositions. So depending on the breed, I always kind of go back to the fact that a lot of these uh, hybrid designer breeds, mixed breeds, the commonality are usually one or two breeds, poodles. I'm not sure what's wrong with poodles. There's always an oodle in it. (laughs) But but you know what? I had a poodle, a standard poodle, and she was wonderful. But people always associate poodles with a show trim. Guess what? You don't have to trim them that way. You can trim them anyway. You can trim them just like a doodle. In fact, they are a poodle, and they have wonderful dispositions, fabulous coat, and you know where they came from. So I'm a poodle fan. Okay. Go for the purebred. Well, I'm not saying go for the purebred, but don't forget the fact that there's poodle in that breed, don't discount the poodle. You don't have to trim it a certain way. The oodle. Right. Are there particular genetic problems that happen? Because I imagine there's a smaller gene pool for these designer breeds. Well, they haven't been documented enough. You know, eventually I think they will probably become a breed that's maybe registered when a parent club has been developed, when a breed standard has been developed, when it's been in this country for enough generations, and I'm sure they'll apply for recognition under that breed name or something else. So many of these breeds are a source of a hybrid. You know, let's face it, there's a breed called Chesky Terrier developed in Czechoslovakia in the 1950s, a combination of Scottish Terrier and Sealyham Terriers. So we're not saying no to these breeds, but they take time to develop, to standardize, and to have certain predictability factors. So we've been talking about purchasing from a breeder, but sometimes these purebreds end up in shelters and rescue organizations. Are there any questions that should be asked to help potentially gauge the genetic diseases that you might have from one of those sheltered purebreds? Well, they probably won't have the dog long enough to understand it. But one thing I do want to say for people that may not be wanting to buy a purebred dog because they want to adopt a dog from a shelter, sometimes you can do both at the same time. In fact, if we go to that breed's parent club, say Siberian Husky Club of America, under their webpage, they may have a rescue uh, link. And what that is, if there is a Siberian Husky anywhere in in a shelter, shelter workers should understand that if that dog doesn't have a microchip and they can't find its home, they should notify the Siberian Husky Club of America uh, rescue organization, and they'll have a local member go and get that dog out of the shelter and give it a foster home. If it needs veterinary care, they have funding for 
that. I do that with my Afghan Club of America membership to get Afghan hounds out of shelters. And we put them in foster homes until we can find forever homes. And Afghan hounds used to be very popular. They're not so much anymore. And there were dogs ending up in shelters. So I feel really good about the fact that, you know, and I tell people, you should look into that possibility. So uh, that's one way of trying to do the best thing possible. You can still adopt. It could be a purebred dog. It may not have papers, but really it doesn't matter. It's your dog, you know, and uh, you're trying to do the best thing possible. I rescued a purebred Maltese, and yes, I know it is possible. And you can also just let people know that, hey, if that ever comes open at your shelter or at your rescue, think of me because I like this breed. Dr. Klein, are there any things that we should be covering as it concerns people who are concerned about cancer and purebreds? No, I think any dog can get cancer. I think it's important to understand that. Certain breeds are known for certain things, whether it's an innate ability to hunt or maybe a propensity for intolerance for heat or some other kind of condition. With the differences, we understand that those are greater chances of understanding those problems. But it doesn't mean that a mixed breed dog can't get cancer or can have heart disease or can have seizures. That's kind of inherent in all dogs, unfortunately. But understand that if you have a breed, what the history of that may entail, understand that with your brain going into it, and then be willing to do anything you have to seek the best breeder possible, and then get the best vet you can to work with in case uh, there are issues. Dr. Jerry Klein, thank you so much for being with us today. If folks want to get in touch with you or the AKC, how do they do that? Well, the American Kennel Club is a wonderful website with lots of information. And my address is CBO, like Charlie Victor Oliver. For Chief Veterinary Officer. Hence the name, at akc.org. Dr. Jerry Klein, thanks so much for being with us on Dog Cancer Answers. Thanks. I hope people got something out of it. And thank you, listener. So while a breeder can't guarantee what will or won't happen in your dog's life, the health testing and information tracking that a breeder does can give you an idea of the genetic risks that a puppy might have. So if you are getting a dog from a breeder, the breeder should be willing and able to tell you about the longevity in their lines and any health problems that have shown up. And of course, a puppy from a shelter or a rescue may also lead a perfectly healthy life. You just don't get the benefit of the family health history. You can get all the links and resources mentioned in today's episode in the show notes or on our website at dogcanceranswers.com. And if you have a question about dogs and cancer that you would like to have answered here on the show, please give us a call on our listener line. That number is 808-868-3200. It's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Just call 808-868-3200. And please subscribe to our newsletter, which is called Dog Cancer News. And you can find the link to do that on the website at dogcancernews.com. Now, if your pup has been diagnosed with cancer and you need some friends to talk to, we invite you to join our very helpful Facebook group. You can find that on Facebook or by going to your website and typing in dogcancersupport.com. That's dogcancersupport.com. If you enjoyed today's episode and our conversation with Dr. Klein, please follow us in your favorite podcast app and please tell a friend or two or three or as many friends as you want who have dogs and maybe even consider sharing this show with your veterinarian and their staff. It helps us grow and serve more dog lovers just like you and me. That is it for today, but from all of us here at Dog Podcast Network, I'm James Jacobson wishing you and your dog a very warm aloha. Thank you for listening to Dog Cancer Answers. If you'd like to connect, please visit our website at dogcanceranswers.com or call our listener line at 808-868-3200. 
And here's a friendly reminder that you probably already know. This podcast is provided for informational and educational purposes only. It's not meant to take the place of the advice you receive from your dog's veterinarian. Only veterinarians who examine your dog can give you veterinary advice or diagnose your dog's medical condition. Your reliance on the information you hear on this podcast is solely at your own risk. If your dog has a specific health problem, contact your veterinarian. Also, please keep in mind that veterinary information can change rapidly. Therefore, some information may be out of date. Dog Cancer Answers is a presentation of Maui Media in association with Dog Podcast Network. 